finding hope in a hopeless world. Today we're dealing with the power of persistence. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're dealing with verses 1 through 5 today. Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, said this, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace. Note something there. All the writings of Paul and throughout the consistency of the Bible, all the greetings that have all, ever been given by godly people has always been grace and peace. You note the order of that. You're not going to have the peace if you don't have the grace of God. And so he always declared grace and peace be, uh, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Oh, I like that word. He didn't just say your faith is growing. He said your faith is growing exceedingly. And the charity, or that is interpreted meaning love, of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Now, first Paul, Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica was a letter that was filled on an epistle that was filled with great encouragement and that encouragement was uh, somewhat focused towards being ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, today, we can be encouraged because we have that promise today also that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Most scholars seem to think that there is, is less than a year between the first letter and the second letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Between the two letters, the persecution of course, against the believers had even intensified to a, to a greater extent. They were going through times of great trouble and great persecution because of their stand for the Lord. Now, in this session that we're going to deal with today, we're going to learn about the power of persistence. I realize there's times in our life that we go through times of stress and times of situations and trouble and difficulty in our lives. And there's power in the fact that we persist. And part of that is what I believe the Hebrews writer tells us in Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finish of our faith. That will give you the power of persistence. Now, I am sure you've heard about uh, Diana Nyad and uh, this remarkable woman who is a long-distance swimmer. At age 28... Uh, she tried to swim from Cuba to Florida, but she failed. She tried again and failed. And as a matter of fact, she tried a total of four times uh, with failure. Several weeks ago, and I'm sure you saw it in the news, she became the first person to swim that distance without a shark cage. I won't even get in that water without it, you know. That's, that's shark-infested waters. She did this not at the age of 28. She did it at the age of 64. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? She swam 110 miles through shark-infested waters. She was battling off stinging jellyfish for 53 hours of non-stop swimming. That's pretty remarkable. And when she finally got to the shore, she stumbled ashore. She was exhausted, needless to say, but she said, I've got three messages. And those three messages, number one is, we should never give up. That's a good message, isn't it? Number two, you're never too old to chase your dreams. Amen. Now you think about that, folks, this morning. You're never too old to chase your dreams. I don't care where you, whether you're 28 or 88. It matters not. You're never too old to chase your dreams. And third, it looks like a solitary sport, but it's a team effort. She, you would have thought she did it all. She says, no, it took her team to do that. And so life has never been more probably uncertain. Changes are happening faster than we can react to in these days and times that we're living in. To survive and to be blessed, you must, you must uh, live fully connected to the power of God. If you're not fully connected to his power, you're going to miss the blessing. Bottom line, you can 
uh, persevere and you can be confident in the fact today that through the trials that you're going through and that you're facing, you are to appropriate what the Word of God says you are. You've got to realize it's not what you today others have said that you are because or even what the world may today declare that you are. You've got to take what God says that you are and then what the Word of God says you have. And you've got to realize today it involves more than believing and receiving. So you, you've got to be able to persist today and move forward in the will that God has for your life. And realize today, I like this. The Word of God says, if God then be for you, who can be against you? So therefore today, uh, the Word of God declares who we are in Christ. I'm not appealing to your flesh. I'm appealing today to the power of God that lives within you today, that God wants to build you up, and He wants to use you mightily. You know, you should nudge your neighbor right now and say, and tell them that God's got an awesome plan for your life. I mean, God's got something good in store for you, amen. You need to accept the reality today that God, the creator of heaven and earth today, is trying to mold you and he's trying to transform you. And this molding and transformation that he's doing, God wants to change you into what he has declared as his purpose for your life. Not what you think it is because Isaiah 55 says the, the ways of God are higher than the heavens. So you, you need today to make sure that your goals are godly goals and to make sure that God's in the midst of what you're doing. So what does the word say I am, Pastor? Well, this is really awesome today. You are more than a conqueror through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God's word says that you are. And God's word says today that greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. God's Word says today, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Word of God says today, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. So therefore, I believe that Satan's number one temptation today for Christians isn't just the issue of immorality or substance abuse, be it whatever it may be. The number one temptation to get you to the point to give up on God. That is Satan's plan. He wants you to throw in the towel and quit. He wants you today to have a defeative attitude and a defeated spirit. And I'm going to tell you what, when you get in a position that you give up, you mark it down, your next, your next appointment is going to be death. Because when you give up, you give up the will and the desire to live. Folks, today you can't give up. You're too far in debt to the Lord. He's done too much good in your life today for you to even entertain the thought of giving up. So Satan's first temptation in the Garden of Eden, of course, was to try to get Eve to give up on God's perfect plan. Now, he whispered her into her ear, you can't trust what God says. And you know, the devil is very de de divisive in what he does. Stop believing. Just do things your way. And you know what, when you're going through things and the answer has not come and you get frustrated, you get aggravated, you get through all those things, you get to the point and you just say, I'm just going to do it my way. Folks, you don't need to do that. Don't let aggravation and frustration overtake you today. Let the power of God overtake you today. The question for you is, are you going to give in to the temptation today to give up on yourself, on your dreams, on your commitment, and on the Christian life? And folks are doing that every day. God has not called you to be a quitter. And there's great power in the process of persisting today. So Paul adds four areas of where we need to persevere and persist. Number one today, keep on gathering with your church. Staying at home is not going to solve your problems. I'm going to tell you something today. Many times we read one of Paul's letters and we just... We just skip over the beginning words to get to the message as we were reading this morning. The word church is one of the most common words in the New Testament, and it appears over 100 times, so it must have pertinence, right? The first time it appeared, of course, is in Matthew chapter 16, and uh, where Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The last message to the church is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, the, the Greek word for church is ecclesia, uh, spelled E-C-C-L-E-S-I-A, and which 
means something. What does it mean? It means today called out ones. We are the called out. Well, what have we been called out of? We've been called out of ourselves. We've been called out of sin. We've been called out of Satan. We've been called out of the world. Come out from Come out, come out from among them, the ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. We've been called out of this world to live a different kind of life that God has for us today. And note what the location of the church is according to Paul. He says, unto the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God is everywhere. Amen. But there's a special sense of his presence in the gathering of his people in a church environment. As we have gathered to worship, remember what David said? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. House of the Lord is what? It's the church. It's the ecclesia. It's the called out ones. You know, we should rejoice over the opportunity that we have the blessed privilege of being in his house this morning. Oh, yeah, to sing those great songs with Tom and to lift up the name of the Lord and to let God touch and change our hearts and to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. Man, I'm glad to see every one of you this morning. Amen? I'm glad to be in God's house. I'm glad that the Word of God tells us, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as a man of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. I didn't get up this morning and say, oh, man, I got to preach three times. Say, oh, man, I got to go to church. Man, I got up this morning thinking, hallelujah. I've got, I got the blessed privilege and opportunity to be with some of the best people this side of heaven and to share the Lord and to declare his righteousness and his goodness and to praise his name. We didn't come to have a funeral service. We came to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. Now, in the Old Testament, when this priest offered the sacrifice in the temple, the glory of God would fill the temple. Now, God no longer has a temple for his people, but he has a people for his temple. And I want you to get that. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, what? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own? So, here, here's a question posed by Paul to the Corinthians. But understand this today. He says, no, you're not that your body is, not was, not going to be, is right now, the temple of God. Well, what does God want me to do then, Pastor? Why don't you go to Romans 12, 1 and 2? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Hallelujah. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. So here it is. We are the temple of God. What are we to do? Glorify God in the temple. Amen. And so Jesus dwells in the body that is called the church, and we today are the body. Amen. We the body, and just think, as our numbers are increasing and God's doing great and mighty things in this church, listen. That means we have more strength to do more things, to be more effective for the kingdom of God. And so, you know, let me ask you a question. Why did you come to church today? Amen. Did you come see Bobby Harrison's pretty mug? Don't do that. You're going to be disappointed. He got that new haircut. That hair, I tell you, he is. He looks like a little peacock this morning, doesn't he? Amen. I tell you, cute as a button, isn't he? Amen. <laughs> Must be because J.C.'s his uncle. Amen. Oh, have mercy. Sit down, Jay. Amen. Why did you come to church today? I'm not going to ask you to give me an answer, but I want you to answer that within yourself. I hope it was to have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, realizing that we should not forsake the assembling. We, sh we need to be in church, bottom line. We need to be around godly people. More Americans worship the God of recreation on Sunday than the, they worship the Creator. Now, no disrespect to the Word and no disrespect to, uh, to King David, who penned this down. But uh, here's a, a different look on the 23rd Psalm. Here's a psalm to the God of recreation. Recreation is my shepherd. I shall not worship. 
It maketh me to lie down in a sleeping bag. It leadeth me down the interstate each week. It restoreth my suntan. It leadeth me to state parks for comfort's sake. Even though I stray on the Lord's day, I will not fear reprimand, for I am relaxed. My rod and reel, they comfort me. I anoint my skin with SPF 30. My gas tank runneth dry. Surely my trailer will follow me all the weekends of summer, and I shall return to the Lord's house this fall, but by then it will be hunting and football season. <laughs> well, honestly, isn't that about the way that it is? You know, if you love Jesus, you're going to love gathering with his people on a regular basis in his house. There is nothing that equals worship in the presence of God with his people. Amen. Number two today, may go quickly, time is flying. Keep on growing in your faith. Uh, after his in, in introduction, we find Paul mentions three things about which these believers that, uh, that, that makes him thankful. What, what was it that made Paul have a thankful heart? He was thankful that they were growing in their faith, that they were growing in their love, and that they were growing in their perseverance. And today, those are very key elements to our Christian walk today. Not only were they persisting with their meeting together, but they were also growing in their faith. They were expanding in the presence and the power of God. Listen, you need to answer this question within your own heart. Are you growing today in your faith and in your walk with the Lord? Spiritual immaturity today was a problem with the early church, and it's a problem, unfortunately, with the church of today. Most Christians feed their body three hot meals a day and their spirit one cold snack a week. And so, therefore, that's why we're weak in faith. Paul chided the church for their immaturity. And so, therefore, today, we, we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto the carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are able. For ye are, not, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? That was Paul's question. Faith is like a muscle. And, and the more you exercise it, the more it will grow. Amen. So we have to look and ask ourselves, are we growing in our faith in the Lord? And if not, then do something about it. Get in the Word. Get into worship. Get into the walk with God. Third, you've got to keep on showing your love. Uh, not only did Paul thank God for their growth in the faith, but he was thankful of how their love was continuing to abound or to increase. 1 John 4 is the real love chapter. You know, we typically say 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter of the Bible. Actually, uh, 1 John 4, 4 through 19, uh, 19 through 21 today is the real love chapter because this is what he says. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he, that hateth, uh, he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. If you're a Christian basher and a Christian hater, you're not a Christian. I just want to be honest with you. There's no evidence of Jesus in your life. In this letter, God made three definitive statements about God. He said God is a spirit. He said God is light. And he said God is love. And the Bible doesn't say God is love. The Bible says God is love. Amen. So love doesn't define God. God defines love. And so God loves you with an unconditional love. That's the way he received us into his family. He loved us while we were yet sinners and apart from God, yet he sent his son to demonstrate his love and to show his love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's God so loved the world. Give me John 3, 16. Somebody quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, his love then also demands a response. 
And that response is that we love God, that we love others today. John wrote, you couldn't say that you love God if you don't love your brothers and your sisters in Christ. God says if you claim to love God, that you don't love others, and he says, you know what he is? This is what God calls you. He says, you're a liar. So God is, is going to send people into your life who need your love and who will demonstrate your love for them. We need to do that. And are we doing that? Number four and the last one, and I think I can squeeze this one in. Keep on enduring your trials. Just out of curiosity this morning, and even to help me to pray for you, and probably every one of us may even raise our hand in this room, how many of you are in some form of a trial right now? Well, I mean, you know, who isn't almost to that point? What are three of the most valuable Christian virtues that we have? I'll give them to you. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love are the three greatest Christian virtues that you and I have within our life. Faith reaches upward to God in response to the grace that he has reached towards us with. Love reaches out to others today in response to the grace that God has invested in us. And hope reaches forward today to the future today to trust God regardless of our circumstances. Now, here's a word from James in James 1, 2, and James 1, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, or that word temptations interpreted trials or difficulties. Knowing this, he said, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It's a place of of spiritual development in your life. It's your place of growth. It's your pray, place of expansion in your walk with God. The Bible says we should rejoice because, listen, and you may not agree with this, but think about it. Your trials make you better. It makes you more dependent, reliant, and trusting on the Lord. And today, if you're not trusting Him, there's no other means of trust. Your flesh will fail you, people will fail you, the world will fail you, everything will fail you, but I'm telling you, we got a God that never fails us. And he's always with us. He said, I'll never leave you. Hallelujah. That's our God. There's great value in enduring trials with a smile. Amen. Your faith in God will never make you a victim. And a lot of folks feel like they're a victim in life. God didn't call you to be a victim. God's called you to be a victor. Amen. Amen. And so don't give up. Don't quit. Keep on persevering because one day you're going to stand before him. And you know what? If you persevered, if you today have kept your faith and your eyes on Jesus, you will hear your God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You know, there's great power in persistence. And so God can turn your adversity into an advance today, but there is a condition. If you do not give Preacher, I just feel like quitting life is so hard. Welcome to life. Quitters never finish. Quitters never cross the finish line. Quitters never stand in the circle of victory. Quitters never win. So God hasn't called you to be a quitter. God has called you to be a contender. Continuing to trust the Lord. I close with Galatians 6 and 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Reap what? Reap the favor, the blessings, and hear our God tell us, well done. That should be the motivation of your life, to hear him because one day we will stand before him. And uh, folks, listen, I don't want to hear God say, you should have done, you could have done. Why didn't you do? I want to hear him say, well done. Amen. Amen. And you know what? This is what's so neat about this. We can. We can in Christ today hear him say that. If today we will continue to persevere in the power of God, for greater is he again that is within you than he that is within the world. Amen. Father, thank you today. We've had a wonderful time in your word. I pray it's been uplifting and encouraging to the hearts and the lives of each person here and even those that are watching now on television this program. We pray that, Lord, it will uh, touch our hearts and God just uh, develop us to be people 
that depend upon the Lord in the perseverance through the trials that we go through, may they build us up, strengthen us, and make us stronger and help us to stand taller. And Lord, help us to walk the path of victory in Jesus today. Now, Lord, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for a beautiful time in the presence of God and His Word and with His people. And we just pray now the outpouring of your Spirit and your power upon the worship which is to follow. May hearts be touched. And Lord, may this place fill up with the power and the presence of a mighty and awesome God. May we worship you in spirit and in truth, and may our worship be pleasing in your sight. And we'll give you the praise, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's servants said, Amen.